Hello, I'm Rob Matheson. This is Counting the Cost on Al Jazeera, your weekly look at the world of business and economics. This week, it's been called crypto's Lehman Brothers moment, and the collapse of the FTX empire has shaken the cryptocurrency market. So can the crisis be confined, or are investors losing trust in crypto? Also this week, a tech industry layoff spree is reviving memories of the stock market crash 22 years ago. But why are firms cutting down jobs? And is it the end of the pandemic boom? Plus, will the war in Ukraine help or hinder worldwide efforts to shift from fossil fuels to renewable energy? FTX has been considered one of the safest and most reliable exchanges of a freewheeling cryptocurrency industry, which wants to bring tokens into the financial mainstream. But Sam Bankman-Fried's empire collapsed almost overnight, highlighting the extreme volatility of the virtual currencies. The downfall has sent shockwaves across the market and raised questions over its viability. He's apologized, but that hasn't helped more than one million creditors who are potentially now out of pocket. Well, the company was valued at 32 billion US dollars in January, but by mid-November, it was filing for bankruptcy protection after failing to secure a rescue from rival exchanges. FTX is now under criminal investigation in the Bahamas. US federal prosecutors are also looking into the case. The crisis has brought back memories of the collapse of Lehman Brothers. That's when the downfall of the investment bank sparked the 2008 financial crisis. The ripple effects of FTX's collapse have been felt throughout a struggling cryptocurrency market. Billions of dollars have been withdrawn from exchanges and the prices of several digital coins have dipped. Bitcoin fell to around $16,500. It had reached a peak of more than $68,000 in 2021. The entire market's capitalization now stands at $900 billion. That's down from $3 trillion just one year ago. And that follows a series of setbacks for the cryptocurrency industry. Earlier in May, the stablecoin Terra USD crashed and broke its one to one peg with a dollar. Almost a month later, the lending platform Celsius paused withdrawals, blaming extreme market conditions. Then came the bankruptcies, including one by Three Arrows Capital, one of the most prominent crypto hedge funds in the world. Joining us from Berlin is Jonas Gross. He's chairman of the Digital Euro Association, that's the DEA, and head of digital assets and currencies at Etonek. So good to have you with us. The collapse of FTX has, seems to have sent shockwaves through the industry. Why was FTX so important? So if people today want to buy cryptocurrencies, they do so via crypto exchanges. And FTX was one of the largest. So with, you know, um, millions of users with billion dollar trading volume every day, right? So they were one of the key players. Um, and what basically happened in the end is that FTX was taking on very risky positions. So they basically took the money of the clients and also the crypto assets to operate into leveraged uh, leveraged business, which in the end turned out to fail, right? Turned out to provide substantial losses. And just, you know, two, two weeks ago, the industry feared that something might be going on with FTX. And this led to the situation that more and more players withdrew their money, right? Which basically brought them into the situation that liquidity, you know, liquidity wasn't there and which ultimately led, led to bankruptcy filings of FTX just uh, one week ago. Mm. And what about the people who didn't take their money out? What happens to their cash? Basically, this remains to be seen, right? So it's in the bankruptcy process now. So we don't know how much of the money people will back or also of their crypto assets. Um, so this remains to be seen, but this will definitely be, you know, um, a, a step back for the crypto exchange space and will, you know, also lead to a wave of probably more regulation in this space, because this was also one of the key issues that FTX was not um, regulated in the sense. Uh, yeah, I wanted to ask you about that, because one would think that this is going to give significant leverage to those who want to see more transparency and perhaps more importantly, want to see more regulation. This is on the short term, of course, the, the development about FTX is horrible, right? So lots of people lost money, lots of investors lost money. But I think on the long run, this can also be like a chance for crypto because it doesn't change anything of the fundamentals about crypto, right? So that FTX fails, what failed was a governance issue of FTX, right? So horrible risk management, very speculative positions, and also the regulatory, uh, regulatory gap you mentioned. So we do need regulation. We also do need more kind of a global regulation because it's not sufficient if 
one country is regulating because then entities can just move to other countries. And this is, I think, what we do need right now and also um, what we will see over the next years to come as a learning of the FTX case. Mm. I, I, I don't understand particularly very much about cryptocurrency. It, it's, uh, it's a very complex situation. And to, those, to people like me, it would seem that this is based essentially on trust. It is on a trust that this system is actually going to work. And when you get system, situations like this, obviously that trust gets undermined. How far do you think the ripple effects of this are going to go? How are other exchanges going to be affected by this? So in the short term, I think there could be that other exchanges are affected. We don't know yet, right? So the situation is so complicated. We, we don't know what, what ripple effects will, will come out um, here. But I think what's really important to understand that this is really not, you know, Bitcoin, Ethereum, the crypto assets are not to blame here, right? It's FTX to blame. It's a company to blame. So the kind of analogy I would like to give is when Wirecard became bankrupt, we didn't say stocks are a bad thing, right? We said, basically, you know, one company, um, co company made a horrible mistake, right? We also need to act, which we do see and might will see after regulation. But I think this is really important that it doesn't change any of the fundamentals of crypto, but of course shows that we need more regulation. And we also do need, of course, proper risk measures, government methods inside these very, you know, important and large crypto exchange companies as well. Mm, there have been a series of setbacks in the market, particularly over the last year. I mean, um, the, the market capitalization, I'm just reading, is down from three trillion just one year ago to $900 billion. Why has it been such a challenging year overall for cryptocurrencies? Yeah, so we, we do see that we are now in a, in a bear market for one year, as you mentioned. And we, we thought, you know, the market was kind of stabilizing and now FTX hit and basically the markets are going down, which I think is a, a logical development. What we shouldn't forget is that this development is not specific to crypto, right? It's, it's specific to all kind of risky asset classes. So we have seen similar declines in terms of tech stocks, for example, that within the past year also declined in a similar size as crypto. So I think the main reason why this happens, of course, are you know general macroeconomic reasons we do see the interest increases in the us that sent basically down the prices of as i said most of the risky assets but of course and we do see also crypto specific developments you know we have seen terra luna crash half a year ago we now do see ftx but generally i would say that it's a macroeconomic situations about you know interest rate hikes high inflation also recessionary developments we are seeing that are driving down the prices of you know not just crypto but general of risky assets mm. The, the big money, of course, is to be made in those risky asset, the, those risky um, efforts that you were talking about earlier, those risky investments, which brought down, in this case, FTX, but others, one would imagine, will be taking similar risks. There is going to be a lot of pushback if there is an urgency, a sense of urgency to bring in regulation and so on, isn't there? Yeah, I think it's it, it kind of this, right? And, and, and this is also why, I mean, we've seen FTX was, was located in the Bahamas. They also had a US entity, but there was no regulatory standard. And what I would basically call for in this regard is like more regulation as we currently see in the EU. In the uh, European Union, there is um, the market and crypto assets regulation currently negotiated, which is also about, you know, exactly regulating these things. And I think this is what we need, not just in the EU, in more countries, and also on a level that is basically, you know, kind of globally coordinated, even if this, of course, from a political level, is definitely, you know, quite a challenge to achieve. Mm. Uh, in terms of investments, do you think that investors are going to be a lot more cautious when it comes to the companies in which they invest? As you say, it's not necessarily the cryptocurrency itself that is the problem it is the management that is the problem exactly so it was the management it was the government it was horrible risk management we've even seen that after the bankruptcy filing some money kind of you know disappeared which is which of course cannot be the case for such large, comp large companies um, in this regard right and i hope that investors do not completely you know basically do not enter this space again because as i said there are fundamental use cases about crypto that are really interesting that basically you know bring crypto can basically lead to the fact that they include people to the financial sector financial inclusion and you know it's it's it doesn't change any on the fundamentals and this is i think something one should consider and why also investors shouldn't step away because these bear markets are the markets where you know basically basically stuff is, is being built and i think this is also why people shouldn't shy away from crypto now but of course on a regulatory side there is definitely the need to act Really good to get your thoughts on this. Jonas Gross, thank you so much for being with us and counting the cars. Thank you very much for having me.
The FTX bankruptcy caps a series of challenges faced by tech companies. Industry founders have been warning about a looming recession for months. They've been telling their employees to expect tough times ahead. Tech giants have long been hailed as employment havens with high salaries, but now some are making the rare move of cutting thousands of jobs, while others are slowing hiring or stopping it altogether. Meta, which owns Facebook, Instagram and WhatsApp, is laying off more than 11,000 employees from its worldwide headcount of 87,000. Twitter has cut about half its staff. Amazon plans to cut jobs too, and the list of companies trimming their workforce is growing. It's not just in the US. Tech startups in Asia and Africa have been cutting their staff too. Meta Chief Executive Mark Zuckerberg is blaming the company's rapid expansion and said he's got it wrong. He invested billions of dollars in the so-called metaverse, pitching it as a virtual reality future in which people will work, exercise and go to concerts. Tech founders say the layoffs are partly because they just hired too many people, while Twitter's new owner, Elon Musk, says his freshly acquired company could face bankruptcy. Well, joining us from Oxford is Vili Ledonvirte. He's a professor at the Oxford Internet Institute. He's also author of the book Cloud Empires, how digital platforms are overtaking the state and how we can regain control. Vili, thank you very much indeed for being with us. Uh, what's changing in the market that's forcing these layoffs at the tech companies? So one reason is obviously the overreach during the pandemic. So some extent, uh, to some extent, what we're seeing now is a correction. Amazon, for instance, has said that they simply hired too many people. They're expecting the good times to continue. And now that consumer demand is going down, um, and, and now they're having to lay off. But another reason is the macroeconomic situation, rising interest rates. And obviously, these, these are not unrelated to each other. Um, publicly listed companies are not able to raise money from the market at such favorable terms uh, anymore. And startups um, that are VC funded are finding it much harder to raise funds from VCs. So in order to extend their runway uh, and, and make sure that they make it through to the other side of the uh, looming recession, they're having to cut costs. How much of this is also down to uh, a misjudgment by, on the part of the management? You said, of course, about the, the, the overhiring during the, the pandemic, but we are used to hearing people like Elon Musk and Mark Zuckerberg make pronouncements about the state of the tech industry and the state of, the, of tech in the world and almost getting it right most of the time. But this seems to be a significant misstep. What's going on? Yeah, so it is significant that this is the first time, for instance, that Meta or Facebook is laying off uh, significant numbers of people in the history uh, of the company. So it is really a sort of uh, reckoning of a sort. Um, and you can say that with Meta, certainly uh, Mr. Zuckerberg, he bet uh, the farm on the idea of Metaverse. Uh, he needed to discover a new vision for his company after Facebook ran into a lot of uh, PR trouble uh, around uh, social media manipulation and so on. And so he bet the farm on the idea that in the future people will be interacting with uh, VR goggles um, in a metaverse. And that is proving to be a very costly uh, a vision. Um, and personally, I'm very skeptical about it, as I think are many uh, investors. Uh, and so partly uh, Zuckerberg's problems relate to his, uh, let's say, I don't want to say yet misjudgment, because the jury is out there, but to this very risky bet. And then as for uh, Mr. Musk and Twitter, he, he paid $44 billion for um, a company that was not profitable. And he came out with at least one idea for increasing revenues, which was to start charging for verification. And it turned out rather predictably, some would say that, in fact, that was a value destroying proposition because it decreased trust in the platform and therefore decreased uh, advertiser uh, appetite. Um, so now he's left with trying to cut costs instead to bring revenues and costs into balance and hence uh, massive layoffs at Twitter. Mm. You, you mentioned uh, the influence of investors there. And of course, that is key because with regard to the, the in rise in interest rates that you mentioned as well, of course, investors are going to try and find a safe haven for their cash as often as they possibly can. And when the Fed has, interest, uh, has raised interest rates, that's chased people into more secure investments that maybe in some way had an influence in whether or not they're going to continue the investment in, uh, in tech companies. Does that mean that we are seeing 
a temporary sea change in levels of investment in tech companies? Or do you think this is presaging something longer term? Well, certainly if, the, if and to the extent that the interest rates come down again, then you would expect to see a reallocation in portfolios uh, towards uh, tech and other stocks. But on the topic of investment, I think it's also relevant to note that uh, FTX, the troubled crypto exchange, was uh, a big investor in um, a lot of Web3 and crypto startups in Africa, for instance. And those startups may now be finding themselves uh, in trouble. Um, a lot of crypto and Web3 startups also stored their funds on FTS, and now they're unable to access those funds. And reportedly, at least uh, one African uh, startup has had to start laying off people uh, because of this. So the sort of crypto crash, crypto's Lehman Brothers moment, is also contributing to the tech layoffs, especially in Africa, it seems. Mm. It always seems, certainly to those of us outside the industry, that the, the tech industry was a safe haven for jobs and almost, a, for many people at least, a guaranteed path to secure employment and decent salaries. Are we, are we again seeing some sort of change in the profile of that? Are people going to be more cautious in entering the tech industry, do you think? Well, let's put this into perspective. So Meta is laying off something like 11,000 people, right? But they hired just this year 15,000 people. So by no means does this mean that tech employment is over or tech no longer provides jobs or even provides good jobs. Um, but it, it does mean that perhaps the honeymoon period uh, is over and people have to think of tech jobs a bit more like they think of any other jobs, that there is a risk, risk of getting laid off and the company is not your family. Uh, the company will let you go when you are no longer needed. Vili Ledonverta, we appreciate you being with us on Al Jazeera. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure, Rob. The United Nations Secretary General says the world is on a highway to climate hell. Carbon emissions from fossil fuels will hit a record high this year. And scientists are warning it's going to make it harder to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius and prevent the more dangerous impacts of extreme weather. They want a quick shift to renewable energy to steer the world out of climate crisis. That would require an annual investment of more than $4 trillion in clean energy by 2030 to save the planet. But the world's leading energy agency expects around half of that amount to be spent every year. However, the International Energy Agency, or IEA, predicts the worldwide demand for every type of fossil fuel is going to peak in the near future. Well, the IEA also says the energy crisis caused by Russia's invasion of Ukraine could accelerate the transition to green energy. So. Will it? Well, to discuss that, I'm joined now from Coventry in the UK by Michael Bradshaw, the Professor of Global Energy at Warwick Business School. So, very good to be, have you with us. Thank you very much indeed. Do you think that the war in Ukraine is going to have an influence on the speed at which uh, the world moves towards, uh, away from fossil fuel and towards renewable energy? Yes, I think undoubtedly it will. But, uh, you know, clearly in Europe, there is a strong determination to accelerate the transition. But the questions really are more, are more global in scope. You know, what will happen elsewhere in the world? Um, it's all well and good for, you know, for, for the wealthy economies who've got the, uh, the ability to fund large capital investments to say they're going to accelerate the transition. But at the moment, uh, some of their actions are making it even more difficult for emerging and developing economies, and they may just have to rely on coal. Where in the world is there are there economies who could actually be aff afford to be making the transition more quickly or perhaps on a bigger scale, but don't appear to be doing so? Um, I, well, I have to realise that this is a very much a, a long term project, which is really in, in its very early stages. So um, I think we you know we point to to some economies which are preparing for a world beyond fossil fuels. Um, interestingly, I think some of the fossil fuel exporting countries, particularly in the Gulf, um, have strategies to diversify their economies and, and prepare for a net zero future. I think for many, the, you know, the, the pressing matter is really about energy security, energy affordability, and worrying about decarbonisation is really not high on their agenda. So I think I think there is you know, a question of, of in, in this sort of poly crisis that we talk about at the moment, uh, there are other matters which are far more pressing. So I, I think uh, it's probably a case by case basis. 
Europe is talking about reviving nuclear plants, and that, that is something clearly that other countries are looking at as well for obvious reasons, because of the, the, the limitations in, in fossil fuel deliveries from Russia, for example. Gas, of course, is the, has been taking the headlines. To what extent is the interest in nuclear energy precipitate? Uh, do you think that there is enough, there are enough studies being done into the viability, the wider viability of nuclear energy, or are people just being pushed because they're looking for an alternative to fossil fuels? I, mean, I think there was a lively debate about the role of nuclear in a low carbon transition, even before the current crisis. I think for some countries, you know, it is a way of delivering a large amount of low carbon electricity. Um, some, some economies have that and want to replace it as it ages. It would be the case of the UK and France, for example. I mean, Post Fukushima, some countries decided they were moving away from nuclear, and that's clearly the case in Germany. I think the majority of new nuclear power stations being built in the world are being built outside of Europe, and then they're being built in places like China and Russia. I mean, I think the other thing to remember, of course, is that Russia is a major player in, in civil nuclear energy, uh, both as a supplier of, of, a, of nuclear technology, but also uh, um, raw materials for the nuclear sector. So you, it, it may be a case of out of the frying pan into the fire if you find yourself actually then being more reliant on, on countries like Russia to supply your nuclear. The other thing I'd say is that there's also the emergence of a small scale modular reactors as an alternative to the very large, very expensive nuclear power stations that take decades to build and cost you know, multiple billions of dollars. And I think that's very much something that, you know, in the UK, for example, the UK government is trying to look at. And it's also an issue in the United States to build much smaller a nuclear reactors that can be built more quickly and on a modular basis and therefore less expensive. So nuclear is part of the mix and maybe looking at a different type of nuclear in the future. I mean, scientists have been warning it's going to be harder to limit the uh, increase in temperatures to the 1.5 degrees Celsius limit that uh, has been talked about. Um, and yet that would require an investment of about $4 trillion to be made by about 2030. But so far, Apparently, only half of that has been spent. Are we reaching a point where um, the governments have been showing some sort of initiative in, there in order to, to basically demonstrate they're doing something, but there might be a weariness of it, if you like, that they, that they might reach a point where they're not prepared to make the, the level of investment that is really needed? It's not just about governments. I mean, obviously, there are, there are variations in, in the nature of economies around the world. I mean, there are many economies where... The government is, you know, the state controls the economy and, and they can make uh, long term investments and long term commitments uh, elsewhere. You know, we, it's a question really of of government providing the context and trying to encourage the private sector to make the necessary investments. I think many, many, many governments are making the right noises. They you know, may have upgraded their NDCs within the COP framework. They have ambitious plans to achieve net zero. And we're really meeting that crunch point where plans are not enough. I think there are plenty of paper transitions out there. But what we need to see is, is, is actually real money getting behind developing new technologies, pilot projects, but also you know, investing at scale in the current technologies that we have. The IEA is always telling us that actually we have the technologies today to achieve net zero. It's a matter of investment. So... Unfortunately, against the backdrop of a current crisis, uh, energy crisis, food crisis, cost of living crisis, um, and the potential of a, a global recession, you know, money is hard to find. So I think there really does need to be a, 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 an open conversation, a frank conversation um, about the role that government must play, but how the government can actually, in many instances, free up that, for, that, that, that uh, private investment and also foreign investment. How do we get the money into the you know, developing and emerging economies as well? I think the time for talking and promises is over. We really have start, got to start to deliver. And it may be that, that getting behind the transition is a way in which governments support uh, the economy and individuals and companies out of the current crisis. Michael Bradshaw is Professor of Global Energy at Warwick Business School in the UK. So we appreciate your time. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. And that is our show for this week. But remember, you can get in touch with us via Twitter. Use the hashtag AJCTC when you do, or drop us an email. Our address is countingthecost at aljazeera.net. But there's more for you online at aljazeera.com slash CTC. That's going to take you straight to our page, which has individual reports, links, and entire episodes for you to catch up on. But that's it for this edition of Counting the Cost. I'm Rob Matheson. And the whole team, thanks for joining us. The news in Al Jazeera is next. <laughs>